Assalamu alaikum. Thank you all for joining today. And welcome to Serenity Breaks. Um, Serenity Breaks is a wellness platform that I, it's been curated by me. So today we're going to be talking about the foundations of wellness and the foundations of holistic wellness and your self-care. We're going to be going deeply into what this entails and how we're going to apply this into our day-to-day -day lives and the importance behind why we need this. So as you all get to know me, um, I am a holistic nurse coach and I love having a agenda just so you know what to expect from myself and you have you know, kind of a context behind what we're gonna be doing. So what we'll talk about today, firstly, is going to be the foundation of self-care. Following that, we'll go into what holistic wellness is and the wellness wheel itself. We'll then move into self-care and how it applies in Islam. We'll then go into a strategic planning portion where you'll work through a worksheet and go do like an introspective deep dive look into yourself and how you're going to curate your self-care plan. And then we will move into a creative aspect and this is going to be vision board creation. At the end of this, we'll do a breathing activity so you can participate in some self-care for today outside of just this activity of listening and you know, kind of applying everything going on here today. So, Moving onward, we can learn a little bit about myself. Uh, who am I? Why am I here? What's going on? So yes, my name is Fakiza. I work as a clinical nurse. I work in gynecological oncology. I run the wellness program over for the staff, the nursing staff and the administrative staff over at Stanford's Women's Cancer Center. Over here, I curate different workshops. Outside of this, I curate workshops and hold them throughout the community. I created Serenity Breaks, which is a holistic wellness initiative. This started because of my own burnout that I felt. Prior to becoming an oncology nurse, I used to work in emergency medicine and in trauma medicine. And over the last several years of working within that specialty, I felt my own sense of burnout happening. I felt my own sense of agitation. I felt my own sense of losing why I was doing what I was doing. And so I had to change the system around myself. And so I got certified as a holistic nurse. I joined the American Holistic Nurses Association. I did a lot of research and networking within the organization and curated this program to where now I have interactions with different staff, with different people, different members of the community who also have felt what I have felt. And so wellness has been this new initiative that has started. And I do different programs, right? They're in person and they're virtual as well. And if you're interested in bringing this to your staff or to bringing this to your get-togethers um, and to bringing this to your community organizations, I'd love to chit chat with you after the fact. Okay, so let's move into why we're all here today. So what is self-care? Self-care is exactly what it says it is. Self-care is addressing your basic needs. It's taking care of yourself. So each one of us individually is responsible for our own self-care routine. Each one of us is responsible for deliberately taking care of ourselves at any given moment. It's about enhancing our internal balance. It's about maintaining our mental, emotional, physical health. And it's crucial that we do this because if we don't, we'll have a various amount of physical ailments that can occur to us. Self-care is going to be essential for us in order for us to maintain longevity and have an overall healthier quality of life. So what exactly is holistic wellness? At its core, holistic wellness is a comprehensive approach to health and your overall well-being. It's about looking at your it's about looking at your health, not as just the physical aspect, it's about looking at it entirely, looking at yourself with your mind, your body, your soul, and your emotions. It's you looking at yourself entirely. So when I do my nursing practice in, within my cancer patients, I look at them not just for the illness that they have, but I look at them as an entire individual. How can I help you with your emotions? How can I help you with the, your different spiritual practices. How can I provide you care that involves something outside of just regular medicine? And so the definition that we're going to use for holistic wellness today is going to be looking at the whole portion. And the whole is what we're looking at. The whole being you, right? The head to toe, 360 of yourself. 
It's important to understand that with holistic wellness, there are four key aspects here. There are four key aspects here, and there is the interconnectedness that you will feel, and this is gonna be that physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual, which is all deeply intertwined. Number two, we have prevention over cure. So ideally what we're doing here is we're doing preventative health to make sure that we are at least decrease the chances of us getting any type of chronic diseases. It's about focusing and preventing issues before they actually come about. Next is third. The third portion here is our personal responsibility that we feel for our health. It's us being empowered about ourselves through our conscious daily choices. Number four, we have balance. Balance in all areas of our life. We aim to create harmony across work, relationships, personal growth, and our self-care. With all of these principles is how you could have this comprehensive approach. With all of these, you'll be able to nurture your entire well-being. Moving on to the wellness wheel. The wellness wheel, I don't know if anyone has seen the wellness wheel in the past. The wellness wheel was essentially developed back in 1976, and that was the first time it was put out. Since then, it's been revised and revisioned and now has eight dimensions. These eight dimensions are what you're going to use when you look at trying to encompass your entire being. So your eight dimensions include your physical health, which is just that, and your physical health is going to be your entirety of your physicality. So just you know, seeking medical care, medical care when you need to, maintaining a healthy body weight, things like this. Next, you have your emotional health. And your emotional health is going to be how you effectively cope. It's going to be how you, you know, have satisfying relationships. It's going to be how you maintain your, you know, just your emotions and find balance in that. Next, you have your intellectual health. Your intellectual health is going to be recognizing how you stimulate your knowledge and skills. Are you continuing to grow yourself and expand your mind so you don't become stagnant? Then you have your social health. Your social, uh, your social dimension is going to be how you develop the sense of connection. There we go. There we go. That's what I'm on. All right, the wellness wheel. Here, here let, me step some, let me take some steps back here. So the wellness wheel, I don't know if anyone has seen this prior. The wellness wheel was essentially, it was developed back in 1976. And since then, it's been worked on. So there's eight components to this. I talked about the physical portion. I talked about the emotional portion. I talked about your intellectual portion, and now I'm talking about social. So your social component is going to be how you develop a sense of connection. It's going to be your well-developed support system that you have in place. And then next we have our spiritual component. Alhamdulillah, we are all Muslim, and so we have been blessed with this already. We already have a spiritual component. And that spiritual component is going to be your sense of purpose and meaning that you have in life. Then you have your occupational component. The occupational component is going to be the personal satisfaction that you have from the work that you do. Now, this doesn't have to be work, as in work, your nine to five. This could also be what you volunteer for at school, whatever occupies your day-to-day -day time. So that is also the, what it means by occupational satisfaction. Then we have financial. This is the next dimension here. And your financial is going to be your satisfaction in your current or future financial situations. And then finally, we have our environmental portion. And the environmental dimension encompasses your responsibility with the surrounding that you live in, the air, the water, and the land. All right, so let's move into now, how does self-care actually improve our well-being? Well, when you take time out for yourself, you give your body food, rest, you give it activity that it needs, you actually will have more energy developed because of this, and you'll be able to meet the daily demands of your life. Now, it can sound unusual, however, when you're able to give yourself this rest that's needed, you're able to meet all of these demands, right? You become more resilient to stressors, and it actually makes you more productive. Self-care, what it does is it improves your overall life and overall health. It's actually a link to having lower stress levels. Yale University was actually produced some research and it was one of the first studies that was done that actually linked together stress with a disruption in your longevity in life. 
So what this means is that chronic stress long term will actually shorten your lifespan. Now, stress can actually affect your body down to the DNA level. So down to their cellular level, you'll have inflammation over time. And when that happens, your biological, uh, biological clock is affected. So what I'm saying here is that, you know, all of this inflammation can cause you to have a various amount of health issues arise. So we'll go ahead and now talk about in each of these areas where your health is affected when you have chronic long-term stress, or i.e. long-term inflammation. So what happens here is that you have issues from your head to your toe. So you'll have issues with your cognition levels. So cognition changes will, will occur when you have chronic stress because you'll have irritability, you will have an issue with memory function, you will have an issue with clear judgment, you will have memory lapses, and then long term this can turn into issues of Alzheimer's, dementia, and then just memory issues going forward. Then you can have issues with mental health. So as I just mentioned, irritability, you know, this fogginess going on. So mental health issues can, stem, um, can you know, come down from these long-term stressors. So mental health issues as in anxiety, depression, you'll feel these when you don't have you know, adequate stress relief. And that will actually then, when you have this type of mental health issues, even if it's something much more mild like irritability, what happens that in this anxiety it's mild, you may not be sleeping well, right? And so you'll probably notice, you know, when you're not sleeping well, you know, that sleep quality is affected. So that means that when you're going to sleep, you're having non-restorative sleep. And non-restorative sleep disrupts your entire body, right? So when you're sleeping, your body is what's doing rest and digest. So when you rest and digest, it, your body is really active at work. It's very active when you're sleeping. So as your brain is you know, resting, all of your cells are recovering in that period. So when it's interrupted, you're going to have you know, insomnia. You're going to have issues with your gut. So your abdomen, right, it's full of different types of bacteria. There is this whole other conversation we can have, and it's on the uh, gut-brain axes that exists. And so what this is, is that there's a direct link between your brain to your abdomen, to everything within your gut. And when you have disrupted sleep patterns, your gut microbiome, which is the different bacteria that live in your gut, are disrupted. They don't get to do that digest portion when you're resting. So when you, you'll notice when you have disrupted sleep over time, you'll feel bloaty, you will feel nauseated, you will, you know, you'll kind of have gassiness going on. You'll feel just, you won't feel so great. And your mood is also not great because of this mind-body-gut kind of connection going on here. And then what happens after the fact is that, you know, you'll have that gut flora, which is all that bacteria. It's not, you know, it's not appropriate. It's not doing what it's supposed to do. You'll have a different types of inflammation that can lead to even skin changes, hair loss, brittle nails. You know, you're going to have these like baggy, baggy eyes, darkening underneath of your eyes going on. So there's a lot of issues that all, that all stem from this inflammation and inadequate sleep. And now, finally, what can happen also with this increased inflammation over time is you can have is cardiac issues. So cardiac issues can develop such as high blood pressure, you can develop heart disease, you can develop arrhythmias, which are irregular heartbeats. And you'll notice even when you are anxious, you sometimes will feel this palpitation right, going on. And so long term when this happens, you're like what's happening then is that the top portion of your heart and the bottom portion of your heart, the lub dub, it's irregular. It's kind of, it's quivering. And so your body is, your, you know, your heart is not capturing those extra beats. And so what that means is that there's extra blood circulating around. And what this is doing is that it's increasing uh, blood clots. It's putting micro, like microscopic extra cells and leaving them throughout your body. It's not appropriately you know, being pushed around and circulating. So what I'm saying here is that it risk, gives you a risk for blood clots. And blood clots can form anywhere, um, in the lungs, in the heart, in the brain. So it's quite detrimental in the long sense when you have increased inflammation, increased stress, and you don't take care of yourself and you don't get to just rest adequately. Now that I've scared you, I'm sure that was quite a lot of information about the physical ailments from head to toe that can happen when you have chronic stress over time. So self-care, it's interconnected. 
we, have, we are responsible for ourselves. We are responsible for easing our mind and we are responsible for enhancing our lives and enhancing the quality of life, especially now that you have the knowledge as to why it's so important to have this. So self-care in itself, it improves your focus, it boosts your self-esteem, and self-care also means that you know, you are setting boundaries for yourself. You're making this something that is non-negotiable for you. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm setting us out two hours a day for myself and no one disturb me or bother me because I'm off, I'm off of everyone's clocks and agendas and everyone that depends around me. It's not that. Self-care presents in many different mannerisms in many different ways, and we'll talk more so about that. But what I just really want to um, you know, hone in on here is that just take care of you. Take the pauses that you need to and really give yourself that time to just relax, rest, and recover. So what is self-care in Islam? And we can shift into this discussion. So in Islam, self-care is viewed as our responsibility. Our faith, it promotes, clear, it promotes purity, it promotes a balanced diet, and it promotes you know, mental well-being through our prayer and through meditation, which can be, is dhikr. All of these are forms of self-care, and they all are here to enhance our fulfillment, and they're all here to enhance our earthly duties that we have. Along with our daily prayers and reading the Quran, uh, dhikr is an excellent form of uh, meditation. And when you perform dhikr, you're also breathing and pausing in between as you do this. And when you do this, you're creating new oxygen, oxygenation that can be you know, circulating through your body as you do this, especially when you take the time and you read through each of the words and you take pauses in between when you do this. Making time for yourself is quite important. It brings us closer to our Almighty and it brings us peace in our life. Ultimately, our bodies have a right over us, over our health. As Muslims, we know that it's our duty to be healthy and not consciously doing anything can actually hurt ourselves and become detrimental, as we've talked about. So now that we've talked all about you know, everything prior to this, we're gonna now shift into the guilt sector. Who here gets a side of guilt when, we, when it comes to self-care? Anybody? Yes. Yes. Now that's quite a common feeling, is feeling this sense of guilt. How can I mitigate this? What can I do to manage? Well, firstly, the first, first thing we need to do is one, pause and take a step back and realize that self-care is not selfish. Right? It's essential. It's just like, you know, when we're on an airplane, we're on an airplane, we sit down and they're going through those safety instructions. We go into the safety instructions and they're telling you, okay, when the oxygen mask drops, put it on yourself first. Don't put it on, you know, your child or your loved one next to you. Put it on you first. So what they're saying right there is that you first have to take care of yourself so you're well enough so you can take care of those who depend on you. If you feel guilty about taking time out for yourself, it's time to kind of change that narrative. Have this open discussion. We're in a time where a lot has happened to us, right? A lot has happened such as global matters have occurred. We've had matters such as, you know, the, the COVID virus that took us the whole world by surprise as to what could happen to us. So it is important that we, you know, take this time, open this discussion about why it is important to have self-care in our routines. Now, I talked about all of these health issues that can arise when you don't have self-care. So in order for you to take care of the people who depend on you, how are you going to take care of them, you know, if you give yourself a chronic disease, right, or multiple chronic diseases, right, or something fatal occurs to you because of you pushing, 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 pushing yourself in work culture. I'd like to share a story that happened when I first started working here in California and the emergency room. And I had a patient and he, you know, he was quite young. You know, we had so many young patients coming for a lot of heart issues. Now this is a 27 year old patient. He came in crushing, crushing left, left side of chest pain, he had abdominal pain, he had left side of shoulder pain. And I'm looking at, we're looking at him in the very beginning, he walked in and we're like, there's no way this kid is having a heart attack. He's 27 years old, there's no way this is happening. Lo and behold, he's 27 years old, 
complete abstraction. We wheeled him within 30 minutes for an open heart surgery. 27 years old, 27 years old. No health issue, no other health issues that he knew about, no family history. I mean, it was mind boggling and you know, that sits with me that this, this, this happens right? when it's this constant hustle culture, we're pushing ourselves, we're pushing to do more, 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 more. And if we don't you know, reconvene and take a step back, these things can happen and, and all by surprise, all by surprise. So how are we gonna take care of those around us if we don't take care of us? It's about reframing that conversation, changing the narrative, having open dialect. Now, Alhamdulillah, you're here today, and I hope you really gain some wonderful insights, and you can share with your friends and colleagues and family about this, and the importance behind taking care of yourself. Now, self-care does not have to be expensive, right? It's not something that's luxury. Self-care, I think, in the past, and can get you know, notated as something that is you know, for upper echelon. It's not, it's not necessarily for us day-to-day -day people. But in reality, it absolutely is. Self-care can be anything you want it to be. It does not have to be, you know, I'm going to, this, I'm going to whatever spa and spending $300. You know, it's, it's nothing like that. Self-care can be as simple as I do my Fajr Salah and I take an extra 15 minutes after Salah to do some dhikr, to make tea, to make a breakfast and sit down, hear the birds chirping. It could be something as simple as that. Alhamdulillah, we have five times a day daily prayer to where we can structure our days to incorporate some form of self-care somewhere in there. Outside of that, though, you also have other areas where you can facilitate self-care. Is that going to be that you have, you know, during your lunch hour, you go on a walk? Is it that you go outside and you're, it's beautiful right now, it's sunny, um, is it that you take that you know, noon walk and you just step outside and you do a little bit of light stretching? Is it that I found a new recipe and I really want to work on this and you know, kind of bring out that creative aspect for myself? Is it that I you know, find some time to call a loved one and chit chat with them? Because that too is self-care. Self-care is also going to be for work in a work sense. So I know, you know for myself, Every day I, you know, I log into work, I log in online, and I take a look, and there's always going to be a bunch of emails, right? Like no new day. Those are not like 60 to 100 emails. It's, it's always there. What I found that I do is I will not just you know, sit down and open my laptop and start working immediately. What I do is I go make my breakfast, I go get my coffee, I finish my coffee, then I sit down, and then I open up that email. Because it's going to sit there, right? What is an extra 15 minutes? For me, that brings me a sense of peace right before I start for the day. So just these types of practices are going to be self-care. You are welcome to take a photo of this picture here. Um, there's different ideas, different ways that you can incorporate self-care into your day-to-day -day lives. There's different areas that you can bring in self-care, whether it's mental, physical, emotional, sensory, self-care for stress, and then self-care for work. For those of us who have pets, pets are a great way for you to release some happy brain chemicals, maybe to spend an extra five minutes with your, if you have a cat, I have a cat, so five minutes to cuddle with them or to, you know, to pet them. That in itself is self-care. It's soothing. So what we'll do now is we're going to now, I'm sure you're tired of hearing me talk, so <laughs> we're going to go ahead now and kind of get into this hands-on portion. So I've devised some worksheets. And we have to take self-care very seriously, right? We have to strategize how we're going to do this. It's one thing to just come here, listen, and take in all this information. But until you apply it, you're not going to be able to actually utilize it. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be self-care strategy planning. And we're going to be first assessing our needs. Recall before I talked about the wellness wheel. So when it's important to, to remember that when you work through these worksheets because it may be that you don't need help in all aspects, all components. Maybe you only need it in one or two components. So only focus and hone in on those as you work through this. So you're going to assess your needs. You're going to identify your stressors. You're then going to recognize your symptoms and then determine the areas that you need these changes. Secondly, you're going to set some clear goals. Now goal setting can become, it can become kind of daunting because you can set goals that are just too, too high, right? It's too much. Like every, I'm not gonna, if I don't already do Fajr Salat in the morning, then why am I going to put my goal as I'm gonna do Fajr Salat, I'm gonna spend an extra 15 minutes, and I'm going to make tea, breakfast, and I'm gonna sit and listen to the birds outside. That's not gonna be my goal. My goal is gonna just be getting up and doing Fajr Salat. Right? So I'm gonna make something attainable, something realistic for myself. And then make it measurable and attainable, and then adjust that as you need to. 
and then give yourself time to also adjust to where you know you might get ill you might things might happen so be be forgivable to yourself and then you're going to choose your activities and then how you can integrate this into your routine are you going to be setting it on alarm on your phone are you going to be putting out like an alert on your phone if you're a checklist person am i adding this to my daily checklist just how are you going to incorporate that portion then step four, you're going to be, like I had said, staying flexible and staying small. And then, of course, review and adjust as you need to. And then just, you know, of course, remember this is an individualized journey, um, and it all evolves with you. Each individual is going to be different when it comes to your planning. So we'll go ahead and we'll get started. We'll pass out all of these worksheets here and pens and you'll work through them and then I will go ahead and walk around and make myself available for those who have questions and I'll help you kind of work through them if you need more insights. So we're going to now move on to the second portion. The second portion is going to be vision board creation. So this is going to be a really fun part of this. You get to get really, really creative here. The idea behind uh, vision boards is that the more that you look at these at pictures, the scarier they become. So the more that you look at pictures, they get engraved into your brain, you're less frightened by them. If you continue looking at them, the more likely you are to actually do them. So it's, it's a tool for you to see yourself as successful. It's a tool for you to become positive and use it as a powerful source of support for yourself. So what we're going to be doing is creating physical boards today, but there's different ways you could do this. Um, you can do you can do um, vision boards that are physical like this. You can also do them online on Canva. Let me go ahead and show you the vision board that I made for my own self-care. Um, where is it? Okay, here we go. This is the vision board that I made for myself, the one in the blue here. And this was my personal self-care board. And here I put down things that I find important to me for my own self-care. And that includes, you know, going on walks. That includes drinking herbal tea. That includes a practice, what's called grounding, where you take your shoes off and you put your feet in the grass and it helps you feel the earth and become one with the earth. Another thing would be cooking. I enjoy finding fun recipes and getting creative in that aspect. And then another part would be listening to Spotify. I love listening to different Spotify's and lectures that stimulate my own knowledge and kind of, you know, get that portion, kind of, you know, give me, you know, gives me like my happy brain chemicals and active. So these are just ideas of vision boards, and you can do them like this was Canva. It's a free account. You can make a Canva account, and you can type in a self-care board, and it'll give you all these templates, and you could put images in. Also, another platform is called Pinterest. Pinterest was one of the original ways for you to create vision boards, and you can make different boards and put different images and save them on there. Today, we're going to do physical boards, and the idea here is that you cut images, you look at them, you're encompassing those pictures into your brain as you do them. And also stimulates your happy brain chemicals. You can be releasing you know, your dopamine, your serotonin, your endorphins, your oxytocin as you do this. So you have the boards. We're going to pass out images, um, a bunch of different images. I tried my best to get good images that will be helpful um, for your self-care planning here. And then there's glue sticks, markers, so you can write in what you want to to incorporate for your day-to-day. I hope that you all, you know, were able to finish your boards and you really benefited from this wonderful activity. You applied the knowledge that you had and you applied and put images of that onto your board. I'd like to share with you a breathing ex exercise that you can implement into your day to day as a form of self care. So if you are all ready, I'd like for you to just sit up, roll your shoulders back as I guide you through a breathing activity here. Okay, so go ahead, sit up straight, roll your shoulders back, relax your face, relax your mouth. If your tongue is raised, put it down. Unclench your jaw. Go ahead and take a deep breath in, and then exhale all the way out. Inhale again in and out. Continue this movement as I guide you. Take note of being present in your body, in your environment. Take a deep breath. Notice how you settle in. Call to mind someone that you love. Take a deep breath in 
and out. Feel the happiness that this brings you, the loving kindness that this individual or pet makes you feel. Notice how this eases your body and mind. Relax into this feeling. Now put this loving kindness towards yourself. May I be happy, may I be healthy, may I always be enough, and may my heart know peace. And again, inhale and exhale. Offer yourself well wishes. Offer yourself happiness. Offer yourself healthiness. And know that you are enough. May you be happy. May you be healthy. May you know peace. Take another deep breath in and out. And again, in and out. You may open up your eyes. I hope that was settling and you feel refreshed and rejoiced and centered as you conclude today's self-care workshop. Jazakallah care for coming, for benefiting. Um, I passed around my cards, so feel free to follow me on Instagram. I post different wellness tips and holistic wellness on there. Um, Thank you.